hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to come back and, and share with the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. So committee, we are pivoting now uh, and uh, welcome Representative Brady. We are moving into S16, um, the creation of a task force on school exclusionary discipline reform and, uh, and going from there. And I think you're joined by uh, Ms. Parker. And I thought that, that uh, Mr. Demaray was coming in, but perhaps not. He may be on his way. They were just wrapping up in-house head on a couple of things. Got you. Would you like to uh, kick us off or would you prefer to wait for him? Uh, I'm all I'm new to all this, so I'm happy to give it a shot and correct me or direct me in the right direction at any point. I will not be offended. And I have my wonderful mentor in the room here. So Representative Townsend will certainly help steer me in the right direction. Very good. Um, um, I, I understand you want just a very high level overview of the bill. And it has yes. just a tiny amount of money in it. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I did notice that it had a tiny as tiny as under ten thousand dollars. So it's I'm not tiny. Sure the exact amount. I think it's like sixty-eight fifty, but I might be wrong. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so, so, so this bill uh, came to please, us. So from please, uh, please introduce yourself first. Okay. Uh, good morning. I am Representative Brady from the House Education Committee, and I will be reporting this bill on the floor next week. Very good. Uh, this. Bill came to us from the Senate and work that had been done in previous sessions as well um, to try to make some improvements to our disciplinary processes in schools. Uh, there's sort of three big things that stand out as the, the reasons for this bill. One, uh, there's a lot of research to show that exclusionary discipline, when, and when we say that we mean suspensions and expulsions, tend to be um, highly inequitable in terms of what students are uh, are put under exclusionary discipline most often. Um, it has, exclusionary discipline has a lot of short-term and long-ranging impacts on students and families that can be quite negative. And perhaps most importantly, it's not educational. Uh, it doesn't actually change behavior or teach students something different. So in looking at the bill, section one is the findings. Section two is the meat of the bill, which is to create a task force in order to do two things. Essentially, the task force will need to come up with recommendations to end suspensions and expulsions for all but the most serious student behaviors. So part of their work will be defining what are the most serious student behaviors. Um, it's not to say that there aren't some times when exclusion is necessary, uh, and, and we know that. And also to do quite a bit of work around um, better data collection, information gathering uh, from what's happening in schools and sharing of best practices across schools because there is some really great work happening in some pockets of Vermont. <clears throat> um, it's a, we're pretty proud of the task force uh, membership. It's a diverse uh, membership with a lot of expertise in the field on it. And we took a lot of testimony um, that is then tied to the appropriation, which is per diems for the task force. Um, section three is, is the appropriation, uh, the piece that's in your purview. And, uh, and section four directs the secretary of Ed education <clears throat> to essentially help the task force with data and, and making available what's already there. So the task force does not recreate work that has already been done. Section five deals with the reports that will come back to the house and the Senate. Um, section six is, uh, is recommending that suspensions and expulsions end completely for students under the age of eight. Uh, and section seven <clears throat> uh, gets into trying to better understand cases of truancy. Uh, there's some inconsistency across the state of how often truancy is referred to state's attorneys. And section eight is your effective date. So the appropriation is simply for per diems for the members of the task force who would qualify for it. Several of them, it would be part of their regular job, so they would not. Um, but for those who would, um, uh, Brianna has a fiscal note for us that I believe is posted on your page today. Yes, and before I go to Ms. Parker, I just want to say that was outstanding. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> well, you that, that, was the, that was the short version of my floor report. So. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> it, it, it kind of gave you a little bit of practice, but that was just outstanding. That was that thank was exactly what, what we needed. So thank you. Ms. Oh, Parker, thank you. That, that might well be the, the shortest fiscal note I've ever read, but I'll let you kind of just okay. tell us in one whole sentence. But yes. you know what? That's... <laughs> Thank you very much, Brianna Parker from the Joint Fiscal Office for the record. And we're really just looking at per diem compensation for this task force. Um, there are nine members that are eligible under statute for this reimbursement. And 
our kind of standard is $126 per diem. And so the committee will meet no more than six times. So that factors out to about $6,800. Um, and the appropriation is 6,750 in the bill. So that does seem appropriate. And that is coming from the general fund for FY22. And that will go through the Agency of Education. Thank you. And we have a couple of questions and I'm sorry, I didn't see which went first. So I will defer to Madam Chair first. Um, thank you. And uh, Rep Brady, I just want to add that was an excellent uh, report. Thank you for being clear, concise and to the point. Um, we, we really appreciate it. I am curious if you all had a conversation and I know this isn't in your typical purview, but uh, this bill is requesting that we pay for this work uh, with out of the general fund. It, it, did you have a conversation about using the ed fund uh, to support this work? I do not recall us having that, that conversation. I, I would be surprised. Um, I mean, and, and truly that is in our purview, but yeah. this is going to be kind of a question that I'm going to be asking. Why, why this, why one fund rather than another fund? That's not your problem. I'm now okay. talking to the committee. Um, I, I, in, in just FYI committee, the, um, this whole need was of a large source of discussion with the Justice Oversight, the Joint Justice Oversight Committee during the past couple of years. There was a, a considerable amount of work and concern around what is going on with particular communities um, and, and the kind of disproportionate burden or focus on, on them for um, expulsion and, and loss of school services. So I personally was delighted to see this coming forward. It's clearly an area of need. And um, so I appreciate the House Ed Committee working on it. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So one of the, uh, just a quick comment, and, and obviously this is, not every school district is the same, but having been on my school board for 13 years, we saw one suspension yeah. and, and, and no expulsions. Uh, and so, you know, you just, and that was for the Rutland City School District. So, you know, you have to, because we had a, we had a very robust in school um, mechanism that could, uh, that could help a student that was just having issues that day. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So it's, but that's just one. There's a whole bunch of others. There's a, there appears to be a, a pretty big difference across the state in terms of, um, you know, it, even school by school within a, a district of, of how things are handled. And there's also a lot of um, very short term, a student can be sent home halfway through the day and that may not be counted as exclusionary discipline. Um, so there, but, but expulsions are, we have in the last couple of years under 11 expulsions statewide. Gotcha. So it is, it is really more a matter of suspensions. Yeah. Sure. It still hurts. Uh, Representative Helm. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mr. Vice Chair, I guess. Thank you. Um, just quickly. So why you mentioned on suspensions wanting to, it sounded to me like all but eliminate them, everything but the worst, whatever those might be for. Um, now, I realize times have changed, but when I was in school, you didn't want to get in a suspension. You, you, if you, the threat was getting close, most of the kids would smarten up because they had to go home <laughs> and break the news to dad and mom, which was not fun. Is that changing today? And if that's changing, maybe we've got another problem. That's a big, difficult question. Uh, you know, a part of me, I come to this also as a high school teacher, so I have a, a lot of experience in the field with this. Um, I, generally, research does not show that exclusionary discipline helps change behavior. So whether it's the fear of it or actually having it happen, 
it doesn't tend to lead to a different outcome or, or change in student behavior. It's, it's removing the student from the situation where they most need probably support and may need to actually deal with that sort of stressor in the moment instead of be removed from it. Um, hard to, for me to speculate, I think on, you know, like the, the whether the, the possibility of suspension impacts student behaviors, but certainly my experience in the classroom would be, would be no, that often we're talking about students who are very dysregulated, um, students who face a lot of challenges, um, students who often are low income students. Um, so there's a lot of compounding factors often in the students who are hit hardest by it. And it, again, so much testimony we got was really compelling that it just doesn't, it doesn't change behavior and it often puts those students in a worse position. They may be out of school where they have no food, where they have no services, where they have no support. Um, their education is further interrupted. And I certainly saw that in my classroom that it, the kids where it was, whether it was two days in school or 10 days out of school, it was always a sinking feeling of, this is the last kid I need to not be in class. He's gonna get, he or she is gonna get further behind and we're gonna struggle to, to, to make that up. <laughs> so I don't know I if that it. really but, answers your question, but. <laughs> well, yeah, and I'll, I'll be done with this statement. Uh, but, you know, so you just answered my question in that they are non at home, non-managed kids pretty much. And so you send them home, they come back, and then you've got the problem back. If you keep them in school, you've got the problem all the all the time. So I, I don't see a win either way, really. But that's all right. You know, I'm not against the bill or anything. <laughs> Go ahead and take a shot at it. But I think that's all it's going to be. Thank you. There are a lot of members of the task force who are doing really good work about what preventative things we can do in schools, like to help students learn moderating behaviors, to help students face stressors. So, um, you know, I think what we were most excited about as a committee is, is not the things the suspension and expulsion stuff, but the way this could amplify some work around trauma-informed practices, restorative practices. There's something called PBIS that if you have kids in elementary schools, you're familiar with where it's sort of trying to really train kids and, and reinforcing constantly positive behaviors. And there's a lot of success around that, um, that that's probably where more investment in that is going to help us than sending certain kids home. <clears throat> Thank you, Representative Brady. I think another portion of, not to testify on your bill, but another portion of this look is that these disciplines tend to fall disproportionately on different um, types of kids, kids yep. that they're seeing as being different. And the, that is troubling and that we need to understand what's going on. So this is a way of also bringing resources to not, not financial resources, but the um, helping schools begin to learn about, uh, uh, about a pro how they should be handling these, these approaches. I, I assume that that will be one of the outcomes of the task force. Represent, I, I not sure who was first. So we'll go with Rep. Harrison. Yeah, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to follow up on your question about where the money comes from. I, and, and the scheme of things, obviously, this is relatively minor uh, request. Uh, but um, if it's an education-related expense, um, I guess, you know, unless we've done otherwise in the past, I think it should be a educated fund related expense as well. Um, and in either case, it won't have a big, but if someone can, um, you know, whether it's joint fiscal or, you know, whether um, a ledge council can give us some insight as to these types of studies. I know the last one we did, I think was ESSER funds or something. So that was different, um, but um, that does probably not available in this case. Um, there is generally a great deal of reluctance to allocate um, these sort of costs to the Ed Fund. And I think this is an interesting area of discussion. I, Mr. Demaray, I did, you, you came on. Do you, is, is, are there practices or principles that you're aware of in terms of our decision-making process for determining which fund um, should uh, support these costs? 
Uh, so I'm not sure about principles, but there are processes I have seen in my time here, uh, which has been five years, which is the per diem and reimbursement for task forces or subcommittees, <clears throat> if they're and if they're education related, always come from the zero fund, as, as far as I've seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is my experience, and I I am challenging the status quo. I I'm not asking the committee to think about this differently, but I'm asking us to think uh, differently for this particular bill. I mean, we can have a conversation about that, but I am questioning the status quo, and I'll get in trouble for for this. But I I. I think this is a conversation we need to have about how we allocate monies to different funds. Um, so thank you, Mr. Demaray. Uh, Rep, uh, Madam Jim, Chair. Done? Go ahead. Yeah, just uh, as a follow-up, uh, again, I, this is not, I'm not looking to upset the apple cart either in terms of what we've typically done, but you know, it's easy for, we, we, it's, it seems, and, and I don't, didn't count them, but it seems like we have more task force and committees uh, coming up than we've had in a while. And uh, it's easy for uh, policy committees to just push it onto the general fund rather than the fund that they are in fact responsible for. So um, and, and again, I'm not at all suggesting that this is not a worthwhile endeavor and it's not a lot of money, but you know, as a matter of policy, it seems like you know, if we were going to have a transportation study, the transportation fund should pay for that study. Um, and this is an education fund, hopefully to improve our educational outcomes. So, uh, you know, I think it's a legitimate question that you raise. Um, and so what if it, it changes the status quo? Um, maybe that's what should be done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Shai? Yes, um, thank you. And I, I uh, agree, Madam Chair, that this is a subject of a longer conversation, but I think it's a conversation we need to have about where the funding comes from. So I'll look forward to that happening whenever we're able to do so. But just secondly, I just want to say that I think this is a great bill. I'm really glad we're finally doing this. And um, I think it's been said by Rep. Brady, you know, the kids who are getting disciplined are often the ones that need more support than ever before, not less. So kicking them out doesn't solve a problem. And in fact, if we don't work to solve it at the student level, they're gonna have problems throughout the rest of their lives that are gonna be much more expensive than what we're talking about in school. So um, I see this as a win all the way around and I'm really excited that it's finally coming um, to the floor and to our committee. So thank you. Thank you. Representative Fagan. You're, you're muted, Peter. Yes, I was. <laughs> I'm just going to pile on a little bit here, and I'll, I will uh, ditto what Representative Shai just said. Uh, and what I'm going to pile on about is, is that if you look at the, the ED fund, as I understand it, uh, it is, it is um, educational processes that are, that are for all the schools in the state, the public schools in the state, um, not for the administrative piece that the uh, Agency of Education provides. So we cannot tap the Ed Fund for that. This study is for the non-administrative, but it is for the, the, the educational processes of all public schools statewide. So while, yeah, we probably shouldn't change it on this bill, I think this is definitely a conversation that must be had. Um, in the future. So thanks. Thank you. So, so Rep. Fagan, did you, did you go back and look, is there statute that describes the, I, I should know this, I feel like, is there statute that describes the use of the Ed Fund? There must be, of course. There, I know there is. Um, and, and it's, I didn't go back and look. This is yeah. based upon something else that a few years ago um, I or someone attempted to do, and I did some research on it and realized no, uh, it, we would have to we would have to not withstand the statutory use of the of the Ed Fund to be able to do whatever it was we were going to do. So we didn't. Okay, um, interesting. So, so and, you know what? Let let us have a little seminar on the Ed Fund. 
we'll we'll organize that. So let we we'll have a conversation about who we should hear from. But in the meantime, let us come back to this bill and um, see if there are any more questions for Rep. Brady, Mr. Demaray, or Ms. Parker. Uh, Representative Shy. Yes, would this be an appropriate moment to make a motion? Um, yes, except I am curious if we are done with the conversation about the funds source. Are we content with as it is now or do you wanna think about that a wee bit more? Uh, Rep Harrison. Yeah, I just think we ought to know what the law says if we're handcuffed <laughs> by the law and we should pass it out with the general fund. But if we're not, um, I mean, if it, the law needs to be changed, we can have that discussion later and not hold up this bill. But if the law doesn't need to be changed, then I think it's a legitimate question. That's why the bill goes to appropriations. Yeah. Oh, um, I think maybe we're going to get some guidance here. Uh, Ms. Parker? Yes, thank you. I've been in communication with Mark, who is much more experienced. So he has yeah. informed uh, this discussion that there is an allowable uses section in statute um, under Title 16 BSA 4025B. And so if you wanted to change that appropriation source to the education fund, you would have to um, change the law to be an allowable use for this particular appropriation. Oh, so, there's Mark. I'm so glad he's here yeah, to help there we this go. conversation. Um, no, it, thank you. It, and go if ahead. Jump, if I could jump in, you also, you might want to do it in session law and talk to the drafter. So rather than changing the, um, the green books, you know, the, the statute yeah. um, for something that's this small and this temporary. I, this yeah. has precisely answered the question of no, we should not touch it here. We're more interested, I think, in the general conversation of why isn't it a, an allowable use, which is now clearly a much larger conversation since there, I am assuming, is no gray area, having not read that portion of the statute. Is it, is it in fact, is this use not an allowable use and and you may be able to answer this better than me but i think that yeah. the, the way the statute reads it it's it enumerates the allowable uses so it doesn't disallow uses it tells you what you can spend out of the fund ah okay yeah, and just, to, just to point out that there's a very uh <laughs> dangerous clause there that says if you spend money outside these permitted uses the whole education funding system goes kapoof. Um, so it's quite dramatic, actually, how this section works with mob. Having said that, though, you can not withstand this to appropriate money from the education fund. So you can either go in and amend the statute to create a new use, or you can not withstand it in session law. Yeah. Uh, so you, you could do, you could do, you could change it now if you want for this one, one purpose. Mm -hmm. By notwithstanding that that uh, that provision, yeah, thank you, thank you. I appreciate the clarity. Um, yeah, uh, Representative Townsend. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I I would advocate that uh, we have that we the, the committee have a conversation about uh, what we think might be an appropriate use of the ed fund in our own time in a different in a different time frame not in in regards to this particular bill only or as a trigger for making a, a change potentially in use of the ed fund um point one point two I think any, if, if indeed following such discussion, we wanted to pursue a change in potential use of the ed fund, that it should be done in a way that allows for consistency um, uh, across the board, not sort of, I mean, we're, we're almost at the end of mm -hmm. this session. Um, and I honestly can't remember if we've had other 
ed related bills that had uh, some sort of committee established in it earlier in the session. Um, I'm just looking at the whole matter of consistency of application. Um, I think that's it for the moment. Thank you. Thank you. I think that is excellent advice. I am assuming with what we just learned from Mr. Um, Damaris, as well as Mr. Peral and Ms. Parker, that we're not interested in making um, a one-time e exception in this area. Um, I, I am not. Um, Rep. Giacoboni? Uh, I am, but I won't. <laughs> um, uh, Jeeper, if there were ever a case, if, if uh, how we best manage, for want of a better word, student behavior, if that's not germane to education, yeah. Yeah. as opposed to the administration of education, I don't know what is. So I was all prepared and gung-ho to do a notwithstanding um, the amount is de minimis, that's not the issue, but to send a message that it's time to do this. However, my, my good friend, Representative Townsend, who, who always uh, makes so much sense, has persuaded me, gosh darn it. So <laughs> I'll just sit back. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Helm? Very, uh, yes, very briefly, made a set of, and a whole bunch of words that I'm not going to repeat, but I'm with Maida. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Doke. So perhaps Rep. Shai, you would like to offer. Yes. Um, may, may I make a motion that we um, accept or approve or whatever the correct verb is, um, S-16 as um, passed by the committee, House Committee on Education? Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, uh, Representative Townsend, whenever you are ready, please go ahead and call the roll. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am ready and the motion before us is to approve S-16 as recommended by House Education. Uh, Representative Fagan. Yes. Representative Feltus. Yes. Representative Harrison. Yes. Representative Helm. Yes. Representative Jessup. Yes. Representative Shy. Yes. Representative Squirrel. Yes. Representative Tolino. Yes. Representative Townsend, yes. Representative Iacovone. Yes. And Representative Hooper. Yes. And there we have 11 0, 0 And the reporter will be? Robin, uh, Representative Shy. Thank yeah. you. So Rep Brady, thank you very much for joining us. I, I hope we didn't worry you with our little antics over the uh, use of the different funds. I, I know that we worried other people in that conversation, uh, but you know, this is, this is what happens upstairs. Yeah. So thank you for joining us. Also, thank you, Mr. Demeray, Ms. Parker, and Mr. Peralt. Um, so thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see you around. Um, committee, our next um, agenda item is at 11. Uh, so do you want to take a, um, a break until 11? Yeah. And then we've got, what is it, S, uh, S115 before us then. But before we go, um, Robin? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. This is another education bill, and we have... Um, I know that some of the folks that are here from Ledge Council and JFO are probably swamped, unless they're going to something else for this next half hour. But maybe we take a shorter break and then come back and see them, see it earlier. I don't know if that's more helpful for them or whether that matters. Well, the problem is the reporter of the bill. Oh, yes, yes. that's true. So I, I everybody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I wish we could be more efficient, but I'm not sure we can be. Okay. 
Okay, so um, Teresa, why don't you take us off live until 11?